there will be later, right? So as it is right now, for this session, it is the last talk, right? So by then, the audience is spare and half sleepy, and you know, it's a good thing, right? It will not make any trouble. And then the chair is more relaxed, right? Looking already friendly, right? So he will not push me to finish in time. I don't promise and you uh, <laughs> to be so polite, but anyway, our next speaker is Melevod Velic. And so he's going to talk about waves and proper topics. So I'll be relaxed and I'll proceed forward in time, just to be sure. And uh, I'll try to make it sort of uh, clear and, and un interesting and understandable uh, because I, I feel like a guest here. So I don't do uh, uh, turbulence, I don't do mixing, so I must be coming from beyond. And so what I do is uh, uh, nonlinear optics and uh, nonlinear dynamics of optical systems. So at least I hope uh, that I come from another world and so that in the end, you will just uh, at least learn something about rogue waves and Talbot carpets. So uh, this is research done by my uh, postdoc, Nikolic Stanko, by Omar Ashur, who is an undergraduate student, soon to be po uh, graduate student at Berkeley, and Jane Gichi, who is uh, my collaborator from Xi'an Jiatong University in China. And so the title is Rogue Waves and Talbot Carpets. It is a bit longer, but I made it short so that uh, we'll be dealing mostly with these two things. Research is sponsored by the Qatar National Research Foundation. This is uh, done at Texas A&M University at Qatar. And so this is how the campus looks like. And so let's now proceed. And let me just give you an outline. Uh, so I'll introduce rogue waves first. Uh, which are intimately connected, which are, as a matter of fact, solutions of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. I'll try to make it, make it as simple as possible, but not too simple. Then I'll introduce uh, Talbot carpets as something that I believe not many people in this audience have heard before about. And then I'll just connect with the modulation instability and the uh, homoclinic chaos this is one of the few instances in nonlinear optics in which you deal with things that are sort of approaching turbulence. Just a simple, relatively simple uh, notion of homoclinic chaos. And in the abstract, just there is the shorter definition of what these things are. So a rogue wave, rogue waves are giant waves that sporadically appear and disappear in oceans and in optics. Talbot carpets are elaborate recurrent images of light and of plasma waves achieved by some devices. And I'll try to bring the two together and discuss the role of modulation instability and homoclinic chaos in their generation. So let's just proceed. So what is a rogue wave? The simplest definition here is just a giant solitary wave. Uh, it, the, the, the notion comes from the waves in the ocean. So it just looks as if it appears from nowhere and then recedes to nothing. Uh, this is an old, uh, uh, by Hokusai, the Japanese uh, wood block artist who just created this print some 200 years ago. And uh, you can see really a giant wave, the great wave of Kanagawa, which by now I think is the, close to Fukushima, some, no, not Fukushima. For, anyway, close to Fuji Mountain, relatively close to Fuji Mountain. So it really looks big and threatening. Uh, here is another example, a big wave. And uh, if you can measure relative size of this one to the ships here, look at these two guys here, surface not uh, seemingly oblivious to what is going to happen. And then there is another example here. Oops. And so here I'll present a few movies, few examples of what 
a rogue wave probably is and what surely it is not. So this doesn't work this, oops, yeah, this doesn't work that way. I have to start it from here. So these two, oh, that's not what I want. So these two examples are probably rogue waves and this is something else. So let's start with the first one. So with the volume turned on, it would look more dramatic, but this is what we have to stay with. Uh, uh, some of these waves look to be rogue waves, huge, giant waves appearing suddenly on, on an ocean. So a, a working definition of a rogue wave is that its amplitude should be four and more times larger than the background waves. And this example here, which is not a rogue wave, I'm certain this audience will easily recognize. So it is not moving. Let's try to make it move. For some reason, the one that you should recognize easily is not running. Okay. So it was suspicious right away that it says here atomcentral.com, which is a government agency which shows a nuclear explosion next to a ship. So it is an example of a shock wave. This one started on without purpose. So let's go to this example, which is an example of supposedly a rogue wave on a beach in uh, Puerto Rico. So it is a beach which is shielded from the ocean. And so the waves are coming, impinging on the wall. And just watch this lady. Now comes the real big one. And she doesn't care at all. Obviously it happens fairly often that these big giant waves hit on this beach, but she's, she's just enjoying her time. So that looks as a real rogue wave on an ocean. And the last example you will also, you should also recognize easily. This is the 2011 tsunami of Fukushima. 
So it, has, it is not a rogue wave, a, a tsunami is well defined wave, although it is rogue, but not a rogue wave. Now, a bad thing about this movie is that actually in this accident, uh, a tsunami, uh, uh, more than 19, close to 20,000 people perished. And nowadays, all you would hear from media when they speak of uh, Fukushima disaster, it is just the, the nuclear incident at the Fukushima power plant. And there, practically nobody died. Four, there were four casualties not even related to anything nuclear. Right. So it, I think it is a sad thing to you know, have this nowadays in news, and nobody mentions 20,000 people that died, but they mention a huge nuclear catastrophe when there was, there was none. So this just continues on and on. So let's get back to what we are here for, which is uh, uh, starting with an explanation of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And as I said, I'll be really simple and uh, just note a happy incident as far as optics are concerned, which is the paraxial wave equation in optics, which is something that we deal often with is actually equivalent to the Schrodinger equation in quantum, the usual Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics. And here is the simplest form of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, dimensionless form, in which you have the time, the space. So here, u, if it is quantum mechanics, is just the wave function. This is the uh, kinetic energy, p squared half. And this is like the potential, in this case, uh, the, the potential is just proportional to the probability density. That's in the language of quantum mechanics. In the language of optics, U here is the optical envelope of the optical electric field. Uh, uh, del x squared describes diffraction of that envelope and this Nonlinearity is the change of the index of refraction. So all the things are really measurable, fine, uh, defined nicely. And in this case, uh, this is known as the Kerr nonlinearity uh, because it is proportional to the intensity of the wave, of the, of the electric field. And so if, as it happens, the diffraction which describes the spreading of the wave of the, of the envelope is balanced by nonlinearity, then you can get uh, a stable, bright solitons which move in, in a certain direction. And so the basic stable solutions are the bright and dark solitons, which you get when this nonlinearity co coefficient is larger uh, than zero or, or smaller than zero. And if you live in the uh, Middle East, as I do, right, then you can, you can connect the bright soliton with the single humped camels and the dark soliton, which has tangent hyperbolic square there as the double humped soliton. What is important here is that actually Rogue waves are also solutions of this simple uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. As you probably all know, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, as written here, is completely integral. So, but it contains very many solutions, and some of those are stable, like the bright solitons, but most of the solutions which ride on a 
uh, background, like the dark and other types of solitons, are unstable as such. And so among the basic rogue waves, we distinguish the peregrine soliton, Kuznetsov Ma breeders, Ahmedir breeders, and then out of these basic solitons or breeders, higher order rogue waves are formed. So this here, this is the transverse coordinate, this is the propagation distance, this is the sol uh, equation written in a slightly different form just to account for this uh, uh, coordinates there. Uh, this is then the real peregrine soliton, and then this is the Kuznetsov Ma, which is a breather in the direction of propagation. And so how does this look like? Uh, here it is a soliton on a finite background introduced by Nail Ahmediev. Much of the progress in this field is actually achieved by, by Ahmediev and his uh, collaborators. So this is a, a, a breeder that he introduced, known by his name. It has this form. And just know that it has three parameters, A, B, and omega, and actually, uh, uh, B and omega are also given in terms of A. So there is only one very important parameter here, which is A, and A starts from zero and goes to infinity, but between zero and one half, these solutions will de describe Ahmediyeh breeders. At A equal one half exactly, you'll get the peregrine soliton, and then later on, you'll get Kuznetsov Ma. And so if we just look at how they look like, this is just uh, given in this. Just look at how A changes as the wave appears. Oops, that's not what I wanted. I need the pointer, here it is. Now it starts. So it starts with A changing from zero to uh, and increasing, and this is all Ahmedi breather at exactly one half. There is the simple peregrine there, and then the Kuznetsov Ma breather reappears. Just remember here that there is one only important parameter here, which is A, uh, which describes completely uh, an Ahmedi breather, and then higher order rogue waves you can get by scattering, by uh, colliding to, uh, for example, Ahmedi breathers. Then you'll get the second or third order rogue waves. And now, what is a Talbot effect? So here it is a text from Wikipedia. This is Henry Falk uh, Talbot, Henry Fox Talbot. So Talbot effect is a near-field diffraction effect observed in 1836 by Henry Fox Talbot. When a plane wave is incident upon a periodic diffraction grating, as it is here, this is the illuminating plane wave, here is the grating, okay? The image of the grating, here it is, the near-field image of the grating, is repeated at, a regular, at regular distances away from the grating plane. And here it is. This is the first time, and this is known as the primary Talbot image, which is actually repeating what you see uh, close to the grating. Uh, the regular distance is called the Talbot length. For some reason here it is called 2ZT, right? Then this is ZT, but actually this is the half of the Talbot length. And the repeated images are called self-images or Talbot images. Furthermore, at half of the Talbot length, a self-image is also, it, it also occurs, which is given here, and as you can see, it is shifted by pi relative to the primary or to the, to the uh, initial uh, image. A self-image also occurs, but it is phase shifted by half a period. At smaller regular fractions, fractions of the Talbot length, sub-images can also be observed. So here is the secondary Talbot image. This is the double frequency fractional image. This is the triple, etc. So you see also very many uh, images as you 
put the screens, and this is how Talbot really saw this effect. So he was not a physicist or engineer, he was just a photographer. So he took piece of the paper very close to the grating, and then there was moving piece of paper which played the role of a, 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 a screen. And then he saw uh, the appearance of this. It was usually blurred because the, the white light is not uh, uh, monochromatic, so it was, he see different colors. But once he saw uh, the full Talbot image, yes, he saw that it is reoccurring. And there is another sort of uh, nice article which mentions for the first time, I believe, ca uh, quantum carpets, carpets of light, and so these are Talbot carpets. And being a photographer, here is another image uh, of, of Henry Fox uh, Talbot, so he really liked to, to take selfies of himself back then. What is, so you can read it there, but what is sort of new here, this is the same experiment. Uh, the incident light, and then you see the, uh, the, the distributions. You see fractional as well as fractal Talbot images. And, and the theory just comes from the Fresnel diffraction theory, so you need uh, uh, to get the diffractive field amplitude. You, you define it in terms of the amplitude transmission of the object A of X, right here. There is the phase uh, 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 factors there. Then the coherent amplitude of the source. This is how the source is distributed. And then E is obtained from this formula, provided you add another uh, propagation uh, constant there. And this S, which is for some reason called T here, could be symmetric or asymmetric, so these are the uh, Talbot carpets coming from up and going down, which could be symmetric or asymmetric as it is. And what is the use of this relatively um, unknown and uh, exoteric, uh, esoteric uh, uh, effect? Well, actually, this is surface plasma polaritons uh, that you get on a film, metallic film, by just drilling holes in here and then this will appear as a surface plasma polariton uh, uh, surface wave on the, end, uh, on the uh, surface of the metal. And this obviously is uh, a diffraction, but on a nanoscale. So you might use it for lithography. And there are other examples. You may just note that in experiment, these are all experiments, actually you cannot see very many uh, images re repeating because you always start with some finite uh, window, and finite window cannot uh, contain more than very few generations. Now, this one here is relevant to what we have, I'm going to talk about, and the, pro the time is pressing. I'm not, not even at the half of the talk, so let's just speed up. Bring the two together, and when you try to bring two together, try to represent uh, by propagating here something which will develop into uh, reoccurring images. So we just tried to put here a simple peregrine soliton and then did the numerics in that direction. So what would you expect if your numerics is really good? That there will be only initial, initial peregrine and nothing else because the peregrine has infinite uh, 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 length, right? However, any, all, each and every numerical scheme that you apply, uh, something appears here. And that's the consequence of the modulation instability. And you just cannot get away from it. You can change the numerical scheme, then this thing will move uh, towards the end, but there will something always appear because the modulation uh, instability is forcing you to go into uh, some of the uh, modes are uh, being amplified, and uh, uh, there is something that after finite time appears. This is uh, 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 homo, uh, homo uh, 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 I mean, chaos, homoclinic chaos, and there is no way around it. But we ask ourselves, okay, if it doesn't go with Talbot, let's put acne deer breeder here. So this was an unexpected phenomenon, but easily understand once you include modulation instability. 
An expected th phenomenon is that Ahmedil, among other breeders that he has found, he found also doubly periodic Ahmedil, which looks as if you start with the Ahmedil and then it just produces uh, primary, secondary, uh, secondary, primary images along the way, if you propagate it uh, correctly. And this is actually what happens. So if you just take as an initial wave, uh, Ahmedia breeder, and you propagate it, what happens here, you'll get nonlinear Talbo effect, but there are no fractional or fractal images. There is only the secondary and then primary and secondary and primary, etc. image. And I cut it here because sooner or later, if you propagate, modulation instability will force in, and you will not see such nice Talbot images. Now, of course, if you take away nonlinearity here from the equation and you still solve it numerically, you'll get the linear Talbot effect, which is, uh, which is presented here. And now, what about higher order of ways? Since I'm sort of running of time, let me just skip a number of, of uh, so it is now that we have to discuss dynamic uh, modulation instability, or it goes also uh, under the name of Benjamin Fair instability. Uh, it is a complex process and blah, blah, blah. Now the major difficulty is how to distinguish rogue waves from numerical artifacts. And so what is the solution is the homoclinic chaos which appears there, uh, but numerical uh, results are very uh, often wrong. And so uh, here is one example which is published, which contains higher order rogue wave, but if you take exactly the same uh, mode of, of solution, the rogue wave and just step half, then the ro this higher order rogue wave disappears. So the published results are very often wrong. And so uh, this is what we discovered. Harmonic cascade uh, road to, uh, route to homoclinic chaos. Let me just uh, uh, go further down. There are, this is totally, oops, this is totally, well, there are too many, but let me just skip all the way. So if you try to put second order rogue waves, and second orders by their appearance look like butterflies, uh, then uh, yes, they'll, uh, they'll just be uh, arranged as a Talbot carpet for only a few generations, but then the chaos, homoclinic chaos takes over. If you do stabilize, this propagation by decimating some unstable modes, then you can get the stabilized uh, perfect carpets from random rogue waves, and this is the second order. And if you continue, you can do much with the third order, but you can also uh, get it in other equations, for example, in Hirota's equation, which has higher order terms in there with stabilization. It is perfect without stabilization modulation uh, instability takes over. But what is the message here? By propagating higher order rogue waves, which usually are thought to be appear spontaneously and at random, actually you can build them one after the other, right, in a regular uh, Talbot cup. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.